Há um olhar que sabe discernir o certo e o errado. Há um olhar que enxerga quando a obediência significa desrespeito e a desobediência representa respeito. Há um olhar que reconhece os curtos caminhos longos e os longos caminhos curtos. Há um olhar que desnuda, que não hesita a afirmar que existem fidelidades perversas e traições de grande lealdade. Este é o olhar da alma. A alma e moral nasce de um período em que eu lia sobre a psicologia evolucionista, que aponta a moral como um instrumento importante para a preservação da espécie humana. E eu pensei o contrário. O que acontece quando esse corpo moral se torna estreito, quando ele se faz um obstáculo ao futuro da nossa espécie? Como se dá esse processo imoral de transcendência, de transgressão, para que essas fronteiras sejam ampliadas? Este filme é sobre as almas imorais, pessoas do nosso tempo que, da minha tribo, e ao mesmo tempo com uma dimensão universal, representam este esforço por expandir as fronteiras da nossa consciência e produzir a possibilidade de um futuro melhor. A primeira porta que fui bater é do meu querido mentor, Zalman Scherter, nascido na ortodoxia, nas tradições, e que se defrontou com os anos 60, Anos de novas relações sociais, novo olhar para a sexualidade, onde os próprios psicodélicos representavam um desejo de ampliação de consciência. That what we are trying to do here will touch the hearts of people who will see this, mm -hmm. and that will open their hearts, and they will become agents for the healing of the planet. Let's say, Amen. 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 Okay. A compreensão bíblica de corpo e alma é diferente da concepção de Darwin ou da psicologia evolucionista. Ela inclui uma outra dimensão da missão animal além da procriação. Sua natureza transgressora. A alma jamais representou o elemento moral e patrulhador dos bons costumes. Ao contrário. Eles são representados pelos interesses do corpo, das leis, do cumprimento do estabelecido. O maior interesse do corpo é sempre a preservação. Toda moral, toda tradição, toda religião e toda lei são produtos do corpo moral de um animal moral. E toda a sociedade está voltada para vestir a nudez do ser humano. Capaz de romper com os padrões e com a moral. A alma é o componente consciente da necessidade de evolução. Só a alma transgressora, só a traição ao corpo moral, resgata a verdadeira possibilidade de imortalidade.
Nani nani, nani nani, nani nani. Ay nani kerali. Ay nani kerali jo, el hijo de la madre, el hijo de la madre. Deus sabe que no dia em que dele comerdes, se abrirão os vossos olhos e sereis como Deus, sabendo o bem e o mal. E viu a mulher que aquela árvore era boa para se comer. E deu também a seu marido e ele comeu com ela. Então foram abertos os olhos de ambos e conheceram que estavam nus. Ao comer a maçã, o corpo foi empurrado para fora do seu habitat natural pela alma. O compromisso inquestionável com a reprodução, crescei e multiplicai, é a própria definição de corpo. Já a alma é a desobediência, o ato de comer o fruto da árvore proibida. No entanto, a tradição judaica não aponta essa atitude como sendo um pecado original, mas apenas como o marco da primeira desobediência registrada na consciência humana. Adão e Eva eram, até a realização dessa desobediência, macacos. Sua transformação em seres humanos e o surgimento da consciência acontecem quando desobedecem. Neste momento, o ser humano conheceu a sua alma, a sua parte mutante e transgressiva. Se deu conta de que sua existência ia além de cumprir desígnios e instintos da vida e que, ao arriscar transgredir, se encontrava também a possibilidade de transcender. Esse momento que é marcado, que é o momento de início da consciência, que é a história de Adão e Eva, o texto bíblico é bastante claro, a consciência vem de um lugar crítico, é um lugar onde existem interdições, onde o ser humano reconhece coisas que não devem ser feitas, a descoberta da nudez, uma nudez que não existe na natureza, a natureza não conhece nudez, e a, a, essa descoberta é, é, é obviamente parte dessa estrutura crítica que o ser humano desenvolve e como tudo como tudo na vida tudo que você vai usufruir que você vai ter acesso vai sempre ter um lado sombra e é isso que a história revela por um lado uma dimensão que é todo o início de uma história que desemboca em nós e no futuro que nós vislumbramos para o ser humano e em outros sentidos é essa ambivalência em relação ao nosso próprio corpo a nossa dificuldade em reconhecer a imperfeição no nosso próprio corpo, que é o que nos incomoda na nudez. É, e é, é, portanto, aí uma, uma complexidade é, que é ganha justamente num lugar que é paradisíaco, num lugar que é totalmente da inocência, onde não existe nudez, onde não existe bem e mal, não há nenhuma forma de discernimento, e esse discernimento é tanto o material pelo qual nós vamos uh, construir a nossa história e é o nosso grande, o grande instrumento do ser humano, da nossa mente, ao mesmo tempo é o lugar que às vezes nos apequena. Criado por pais ateus, aqui vai entrar em contato com a tradição judaica aos 22 anos, quando a irmã se suicida e o pai decide que é a hora do filho ir para Israel. Ele só se reconhece na cultura judaica 
enquanto durante um passeio por um vale no deserto, escuta o chamado de Deus. Every living being is a pounding drum. So when people say I don't have rhythm, this is nonsense. Your heart is beating from the time you're born, you have rhythm. Now when you come to prayer, they say please, we don't like that. We don't like the drums in the in the in the church, in the synagogue, in the mosque. With all due respect, the people know better. The people want this. The people love this. When you when you offer them that, they always say yes. But when it's forbidden, they they follow the rules. And there are, we have many rules like this. Where did these rules come from? In our neck of the of the world, they came because the temples were destroyed. And there was a feeling that we are in exile. There is a feeling that we should be in mourning. That's why our prayers are in such minor keys. It ain't necessarily so. Barhu esadonai hambora. It's the same notes, okay? If God were a drummer, what would God's beat be? Can you feel it? Feel it, feel this beat, feel it, feel it, this is God's beat, feel it, feel it, feel this beat, pounding deep in you, pushing you to be you, this is a Kaddosh Baruch Hu. can you feel it, feel it, feel God's beat, feel it, feel it. All the way to your feet, can you feel it, feel it, feel God's beat, pound deep in you. O Senhor disse a Abraão, Anda da tua terra, da tua parentela e da casa de teu pai para a terra que eu te mostrarei. Abraão é um transgressor. Sua história pessoal começa com a escuta de um comando. Sai, rompe, em outras palavras, trai. Simbolicamente, ele é o herói que empreende a viagem do seu corpo em direção à sua alma. Rompe consigo mesmo e com a narrativa tanto de sua origem como de sua identidade herdada para se tornar um modelo da arte de se reinventar e evoluir. Por um lado, ele é o pai da tradição, compreendendo a importância de transmitir valores às gerações seguintes. E, no episódio do sacrifício de Isaac, o pai de um novo paradigma. Toma agora o teu filho, o teu único filho, Isaac, a quem amas, e vai-te à terra de Moriá e oferece-o ali em holocausto sobre uma das montanhas. O anjo do Senhor lhe bradou desde os céus e disse, Abraão, Abraão, e ele disse, eis-me aqui, então disse, não estendas a tua mão sobre o moço e não lhes faça nada, porquanto agora sei que temes a Deus e não negaste o teu filho, o teu único filho. Ao atender ao comando deste sacrifício, que era parte da cultura local de seu tempo, Abraão constrói uma ponte entre obedecer e desobedecer ousando ir ao ponto de maior tensão entre executar a ordem e não fazê-lo, ele encontra uma maneira íntegra de desobedecer e ouvir um novo comando que desdizia o anterior. Seu ato mutante é um ato de preservação. Sua rebeldia é uma forma de responsabilidade e sua transgressão provém de sua retidão. Ele é, sem dúvida, um representante da alma imoral. Música 
Esse vale é talvez um dos lugares mais antigos da cidade de Jerusalém, onde as pessoas uh, faziam sacrifícios ao Deus Baal, traziam aqui seus filhos, normalmente o primogênito, e sacrificavam aqui nesse vale aqui embaixo. Uh, é daqui desse vale que uh, o termo inferno na tradição judaica, Guerrena, ganha o seu nome. Para a gente é importante porque esse é um dos lugares, uh, talvez um dos lugares aqui do planeta, que marca um ponto da consciência do ser humano, onde o ser humano se fazia perguntas sobre o certo e errado, onde um lugar entre o inconsciente e o consciente se encontravam. Ele está bem aqui registrado, a conexão com o momento em que Abraão segura a faca e não cumpre com esse desígnio de sacrificar seu filho. Esse é o ponto, esse é o lugar. Em 1953, o casal Julius e Ethel Rosenberg é executado nos Estados Unidos sob a acusação de passar informações sobre a bomba atômica aos soviéticos. Mantém sua integridade nas posições políticas e morre lutando por uma crença maior do que sua própria existência. One of the greatest peacetime spy dramas in the nation's history reaches its climax as Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel, convicted of revealing atomic secrets to the Russians, enter the federal building in New York to hear their doom. Another of the spy ring, Mrs. Ethel Rosenberg, who with her husband was convicted of actually transmitting the secrets to Russia through Soviet diplomatic channels. It is a stern jurist they face in Judge Irving Kaufman after administering a tongue lashing in which he charged them with the indirect death of thousands of men in Korea, he sentenced both Rosenbergs to death in the electric chair and Sobel to 30 years in prison. It is the first time in peacetime that such a death penalty has been handed down. My parents were arrested when I was three and they were executed uh, when I was six. Uh, my brother is three, four years older than me, so he understood a lot more. I was seven when Julius and Ethel were arrested, visited them in prison starting when I was eight, and then I was ten when they were killed. Just to make it clear, my parents were charged with conspiracy to commit espionage. They weren't charged with espionage, they weren't charged with treason. The government cheated in order to obtain a conviction is the simplest way to put it. Because the only thing the government wants is not a confession, They want names. If you cooperate, you will get clemency. That's the only way you're going to live, if you cooperate. And that would have been a terrible betrayal for both of them, a betrayal of the people that he got into this. Neither Julius nor Ethel Rosenberg were master atomic spies, members of an atomic spy ring that stole the secret of the atomic bomb. But, and Ethel was not guilty of any active involvement in espionage. But she knew that Julius was involved with a group of young people to help the Soviet Union defeat the Nazis and continuing after World War II by providing military industrial information uh, to the Soviet Union. Uh, so that Julius was guilty of something. Um, but that the government knew from the very beginning that neither Ethel nor Julius were guilty of the thing that they killed them for. How did you and your brother relate to that? Because uh, as being a good soldier, he was not being a good uh, chief of the family. Kind of. Well, I mean, I think that in some ways that's the hardest question. Um, you know, why would someone with small children decide to engage in this kind of activity. In many ways, people take the kind of actions that my father did for the benefit of their children. Because of what they did, we get to grow up to be proud. At a very, very, very high cost. Yes, yes, yes. And, and as I said before, you know, if If, if we had been bounced around instead of finding Abel and Ann Mirapol, uh, our lives might be much different. I owe a tremendous debt to the people who saved me 
So rather than seeing myself as being owed a debt, I see myself as owing a debt. And, and part of that is Abel and Ann Mirapol. And Abel Mirapol wrote, was a writer, and he wrote the very famous anti-lynching anthem, Strange Fruit, that Billie Holiday popularized and that now has been reproduced worldwide and is, is uh, the, the United States magazine, Time Magazine, which is a very major publication here, though now magazines are kind of disappearing, uh, pronounced it the song of the century uh, in the year 2000. Uh, well, that was a song about lynching. And from Abel Mirapol's perspective, the Rosenberg case was a legal lynching. Acatando a sugestão do pintor Marco Chagall, Franz Kreisberg vem morar no Brasil. Aqui fará da sua arte um grito de alerta contra o holocausto dos indígenas e o progresso predatório que destrói a natureza. Perto da fronteira da Rússia na Polônia, eu liberei um pequeno campo de concentração com húngaros que eu vi lá falando e eu começo a chorar. Franz, deixa eu te perguntar, o teu trabalho, essa, essa história que você tem, essa história toda, como mistura essa história entre a Europa, Holocausto e Ecologia? Foi muitas vezes na Amazônia, porque eu me interesso pela saúde do planeta. Eu me encontrei no Rio Negro, de repente a gente viu um fogo. Eu vejo assim, vejo uma índia e a filha virar uma escultura preta, tudo queimado. Essa foto eu mostrei em Davos, toda a sala levantou gritando sem parar a revolta contra essa massacre que estão contra os índios. No Mato Grosso, você viu índios pendurados, enforcados. Sim. No Brasil, vê isso no meio da floresta. Qual é o teu sentimento? Isso, rio Juruena. Eu vi uma nuvem no céu do robôs. Eu mandei meu barco ir na direção lá. Eu desci do barco, mas foi, não foi fácil tanto o robô que tinha. Eu fechei os olhos, fiz uma foto, virei e fui embora. Eu pego o resto de queimadas, trago até da Amazônia para fazer esculturas que gritam. Eu me interesso muito pela vida, pelo planeta e pelo homem. 
não gosta que a separam. Não aguento mais ver esse racismo que tem contra a gente. Isso não aguento. A passividade aqui me machuca muito. Todos nós nos deparamos com lugares que se tornam estreitos. Esses lugares que serviram para nosso desenvolvimento viram limitadores. O corpo não gosta de mudar. São a estreiteza e o desconforto que convencem de que não existe outra saída. A fuga dos hebreus do Egito para deixar a escravidão rumo à liberdade simboliza a tensão entre os interesses do corpo e da alma. Arrependido por ter permitido que os hebreus deixassem o Egito mesmo após sofrer dez pragas diferentes, o faraó os encurrala junto ao mar. Em desespero, os hebreus se voltam ao líder Moisés. O que fazer? O povo, representativo do corpo, se divide em quatro acampamentos em meio à confusão. O primeiro quer voltar e se conformar com as limitações. O segundo acha que tem condições de lutar e se dispõe à impossível tarefa de transformar o lugar estreito em amplo. O terceiro cai em desespero e quer jogar-se ao mar. O quarto se mobiliza em oração esperando que o novo, magicamente, não implique em que ele mesmo tenha que se modificar. Assim, não há passagem pelo mar. A resposta de Deus às vacilações do corpo é decisiva e intrigante. Diga a Israel que marche. Steven Greenberg é o primeiro rabino ortodoxo abertamente gay. Sua fala é pautada pela tensão entre compromissos e rompimentos, a partir da perspectiva de um ortodoxo que se recusa a abandonar sua fé ou a sua comunidade religiosa. É casado com o ator Steven Goldstein. O mito da casamento judeu é que você ama alguém tão muito que você está disposto a oferecer esse amor como um recurso para Deus para fazer grandes coisas com ele. Então, a casamento não é sobre seguir o amor, não é. It's about saying we've fallen in love and now we're ready to make our love a public trust for, for, for the use of God and the society and community to do good things with. So we're giving our love away. We, our love, this love with a partner, is now, is now uh, usable for everybody to, to grow the society. That's incredibly beautiful. The myth of that is Eden and the redemption of Jerusalem. Because every man and a woman who start the world over again like Adam and Eve and the perfection of the world will only come if we have men and women coming together and making families and babies. That is not a gay story. It is a beautiful straight story. Do I need to gerrymander and force a beautiful straight story into a gay story? Because I need to you know, have everything you have? No. I need to have a beautiful gay story. There's moments in which the rules are insufficient for our transformation. But we don't have the way to get there. So I have the best quote for you. Rav Kook in Arpele Tor wrote the following. Sometimes it's, it's necessary to burst through and transgress. And it, you know, uh, because we don't have prophecy anymore to do this in the right way, and no one knows how, so the next stage is accomplished by transgression that 
of itself makes us sad, but of its consequences make us happy. Now here's what I think he's saying, is that sometimes the system can't correct itself. And the only thing that corrects it are brave and dangerous actors who do what's good, even though it's, you call it, wrong. It, the system has no way to get there. And so they jump over the river and do what they must. And then they build the bridge, bridge, bridge backwards over the river and then everyone can crawl out. A congregação Chá Zahav acolhe todas as sexualidades, gêneros, raças e arranjos familiares. Sediada em São Francisco, faz de seu ativismo uma forma de avançar no judaísmo a questão da tolerância e do respeito à diversidade. Quando eu era uma criança, no meu pai de morte, he asked me in this liminal state, um, would I marry a Jew? I promised him with all my heart. It didn't occur to me at that time to say, Papa, if I fall in love with a woman, is this okay? <laughs> In truth, the fulfillment of my commitment to my father, that promise that I made, really came upon becoming an ima. It was in becoming a parent that I discovered I, I had fulfilled my task. I, I could see that my child was loving Shabbos and loving Jewish music and, and appreciating nature and not for a moment questioning the authenticity of her Jewish family or community here amongst so many other families where there are two moms or one gay father or um, just the diversity in, in how she looks at what is a Jewish community. Um, I, I could see that we've arrived. This, there are enough ambassadors of the next generation, like queer spawn, we, we, tease, uh -huh. we tease, we call them. Uh -huh. A lot of people don't like this word queer, so um, generationally we're very careful about how we use that word, but, but the young people who are having children, these children who've grown up, they, they go and they, they say, what's your problem? My parents are gay, uh -huh. you know? We, we were in D.C., in, in Washington, D.C. once with a group of, of teenagers to lobby on Capitol Hill for the end of, of, of um, DOMA. And this group of kids were from Atlanta. And they said, oh, they didn't know anything about us. They didn't know anything about us except that we were a form congregation from San Francisco. Uh -huh. And they said, San Francisco? Are there like gay, are there like homosexuals everywhere? <laughs> and a young man in my, in my youth group, he says, they are everywhere. They're in our homes, they're in our temples. We're crawling with them. <laughs> <laughs> O Rabi Yoshua, filho do Rabi Hanina, disse, Certa vez uma criança arrebatou o melhor de mim. Eu viajava e me encontrava diante de uma encruzilhada. Vi então um menino e lhe perguntei qual seria o caminho para a cidade. Ele respondeu, Este é o caminho curto e longo, e este o longo e curto. Tomei o curto e longo, e logo deparei com obstáculos intransponíveis de jardins e pomares, ao retornar, reclamei. Meu filho, você não disse que era o caminho curto? O menino então respondeu. Porém, ele disse que era longo. Na trilha da sobrevivência, a mesmice muitas vezes é o caminho curto, mais simples, que tem os custos mais elevados. Longo. Ir pelo caminho mais simples e mais curto é uma lei evolucionista. Os corpos se movem na direção mais imediata e curta. Os galhos buscam a luz, 
e o animal à água, mas sua inteligência interna, sua alma, está atenta a longas modificações. As espécies sobreviventes são aquelas que souberam fazer opções pelo longo caminho curto. Nossos mecanismos de detectar se são curtos longos ou longos curtos apontam novos inícios de relações de trabalho, amor ou amizade. A coragem está em ouvir o menino das encruzilhadas, a alma. A medieval concept of truth is one degree of 360 degrees. A new age concept of truth is 360 degrees of truth. And each degree of truth has a degree of counter truth. So when uh, in, in philosophy if I, or in theology, if I veer away from one degree of truth, they already say, that's heresy. You know, I say something else that, that isn't Roman Catholic, but it's a little bit more uh, Greek Catholic, that's already considered to be wrong. But if I go and say that there is 360 degrees of truth, And how did I get to that? I got to that not from the yeshiva. I got to that from psychedelics. There is a place, and this is what people are trying to do now with ayahuasca and with all the other ways of saying, I want to know not from what I learned because somebody taught me this, but I want to know from my basic experience. And so when somebody goes into and says, I want B Pachamama to tell me what's going on, never mind what, what the teachers or the books tell me. Nascido na Alemanha, Uri Avneri emigrou com sua família para a Palestina em 1933, fugindo do nazismo. Lutou por Israel na Guerra da Independência. Logo percebeu a importância da coexistência com os palestinos e tornou-se um transgressor que luta pela paz. I'm a political person. I had to be because when I was in Germany, I witnessed the end of the German Republic and the beginning of the Nazi regime. So when I was uh, just turned 15, I joined a terrorist organization called the Irgun, which was a right-wing fighting organization. Of course, we did not call ourselves terrorists. We were freedom fighters. But the British insisted on calling us terrorists. The, the Irgun was very right-wing. I didn't feel right-wing. The Irgun was anti-Arab. I did not feel anti-Arab. And I did not really believe that we can liberate the country by uh, the methods of terrorism. That's why I left. And I was a soldier for about a year. So when I came out of that war, the first thing I did was to look for Arab cooperators in order to grow, found a group devoted to the idea of The, what we now call the two-state solution. That was the beginning of the two-state solution. When, when my first book came out, I became, I told you it was an incredible bestseller, totally crazy. And the more popular I became, the less I liked it. Because I thought I'm becoming popular for the wrong reasons. So I said, this can't go on. And I wrote a second book called The Other Side of the Coin in which I described the other side of the war. The killing, the uh, evictions of the Arab population, and things like this. It created a huge scandal again. And from one day I became a national hero to a national traitor. I was 10 years in the Knesset. I made more than a thousand speeches in the Knesset, which was uh, No one even came close to it ever yeah, until today. And, uh, and I propagated the same things. Uh, 
alliance with the Palestinian, recognizing the Palestinian two-state solution, uh, complete separation between religion and state, uh, treatment of the Arab, equality for the Arab minority in Israel, and so on. And I started to establish contact, which was strictly illegal, with the PLO outside the country. Arafat sent a message to Said Khamami. Said Khamami sent a message to me. I took the message to, Araf to uh, Rabin. And so it went back and forth. All kinds of proposals. Arafat made all kinds of proposals, not in big things, small things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rabin refused all of them. But there was a contact established. Transgredir é transcender. Nossa história não teria mártires no campo político, científico, religioso, cultural, artístico, se fosse possível transcender sem colocar em risco a sobrevivência da espécie. Mesmo a sede de poder não é tão aterradora para a tradição como a traição pela transcendência. Se por sede de poder alguém rompe com um senso comum para a preservação e reprodução de nossa espécie, é um fora da lei. O traidor, por sua vez, é um transgressor. Ele propõe outra lei e outra realidade. Se alguém rompe com uma estrutura tradicional de família, pode ser caracterizado como perverso e tem o seu lugar garantido na sociedade. Ele é o que não se deve fazer. Mas, se o rompimento é acompanhado de um desejo de legitimação dessa conduta, esse indivíduo é inaceitável e um bom candidato ao martírio. Publicado em 34 idiomas, autor de dezenas de livros, cineasta. Edgar Queret é considerado a maior voz da sua geração. My parents upbringing was very different and strange, you know, and the and my father told me the only time in your life that you were obliged to speak up is when people tell you, tells you tell you to shut up. He said, if nobody told, tells you, and the truth is that in the last war, uh, at some stage, when, when they basically threatened every person who, who spoke up, you know, the extreme right wing had threatened him, I realized that, you know, that, uh, that the choice to stay, remain silent was taken away from me. And of course, you know, I, me and my wife we expressed our opinion, you know, it was on the, we, we had, to pay a price for it, we were threatened, you know, but at the same time, uh, doing that, uh, uh, we, 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 kept, we felt that, you know, that uh, we would not be complete if we won't say what we were saying. And I want to say that there is something, you know, in Israel, always the discourse is left-wing and right-wing. I think that one of uh, uh, the, the, the most uh, controversial uh, essay that I wrote was very linguistic. It was, I always write from a linguistic point of view. And what I said, I said that the word peace became a malignant to the region. Because why? When you talk about peace, everybody wants peace. Hamas wants peace, Israel wants peace. We all want peace. What does peace mean? That you can do what you want and nobody kills you. But what does compromise mean? Compromise means that you have to give something in return. Peace, you, do, you ask God for peace. Compromise, you negotiate, you know. And this, the, enough, it, this, saying this was enough to get people 
extremely aggressive and threatened, you know? Just the, this, just the fact that I asked that we use one word instead of another. When you talk about this reality, and and when you talk about, let's say, the clash inside Israeli society, I always say that the, the difference between right-wing and left-wing, fundamentally, is the difference between optimism and pessimism. <laughs> because a left wing always say things can get better and right wing say this is as good as it gets. Don't touch it, it's gonna break, everything is gonna be ruined, you know? And, and what, what, what I feel very much is that the ability to be optimistic became a threat to some people in this society, you know? And I think that for me, the breaking point was really when my son, who's now nine years old, he told me at some stage, he said to me, uh, he, he said to me, uh, you know, I have no problem with the fact that you and mother want peace. I just don't want you to say it out loud. And I said to him, why? And he said, well, you know, we learned in school that all the people in the Middle East that said that they want peace got killed. Yitzhak Rabin, Sadat. John Lennon, I don't know how John Lennon fits in the <laughs> Middle East, but for my, my son, it made sense. So I thought to myself, what, in what stage had we arrived in which to, to have a racist remark is something safe. My son doesn't have a problem if I say something racist. It's not dangerous. But to want peace became this kind of a thing that is outside of the consensus, the things that they... Uh, should you, uh, that you should be punished for doing it, you should be threatened for doing it. It makes you dissident, just the fact that you wish to live in a better place or in a more moral place. Natalie Cohen is an artist, anarchist and internationalist who manifests his protest through monologues. The performances that the actress led the authorities to prohibir that use the internet e teve seus computadores confiscados por meses. Look, all my monologues, I have the monologue about the, the you know, the... A teenage that uh, was raped by a, a, by a soldier through this eyes of this teenager who uh, who think that uh, soldiers are uh, you know like angels and even if he he raped her uh, uh, so uh, it's okay I, I she said I I don't need to complain because I need to say thanks to him or something like this so Say thanks that he did it with a, a condom. How do you say yeah. Con condom? Yeah. It's a, it's universal condom. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you know, usually I have anger in my uh, in my monologues, but it came with a lot of humor too. <laughs> הבאתי לכם ויאגרה ויין שתרגישו חופשי לשפשף על החומה את הזין. ומולטיוויטמין כדי שיהיה לכם כוח להקים עוד מחסום. וגז מדמיע שתיקחו את חופש הביטוי מכל המפגינים. I prefer to die about, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, to be quiet all my life and don't uh, do things because the cops try to to, you know, uh, to scare me. But I'm not scared from the cops. They need to be scared from me. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> A natureza de toda a experiência espiritual é a tensão constante entre duas preocupações opostas, preservar e trair. Ela se nutre das tensões da experiência do passado a ser preservado e do futuro a ser construído a partir da traição. 
A importância do presente está na responsabilidade que temos de honrar o passado e o futuro numa medida artisticamente concebida de compromissos e rompimentos. Tikkun é uma das revistas mais respeitadas do mundo judaico e também uma das mais controvertidas, onde seus criadores, o rabino Michael Lerner, defende o direito da ação política progressista entre os judeus e uma leitura das tradições religiosas engajada com as questões sociais. The network of Tikkun um, was founded in part after the work of the Institute for Labor and Mental Health. And we are, technically, we are part of that institute. And I'm the, the executive director of the Institute for Labor and Mental Health. And we did a 10-year study of the psychodynamics of American society. And it was at a time when middle-income working people were starting to move politically to the right. And the question that we were asking was, why is this happening? Now, the left had its answer. And the answer was, the reason why middle-income working people are moving to the right is because they're racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic or stupid, and one of these is the, is the explanation, and uh, depending on who you're dealing with. Um, but we started to, um, be, and, and why stupid? Because they said, well, because they're acting against their real interests, their, their economic, and what they meant was that the right is clearly not supporting their economic interests, and the left is, and nevertheless they're voting for the right. So we started to inquire about this, and what we learned Uh, after uh, dealing with thousands of people in our, in our research, was that, there, that um, the left was wrong, that there was actually a deep spiritual crisis in American society, a crisis that was based on the materialism and selfishness that, is, that people learn every day in the world of work. They learn that the bottom line is maximize money and power. They learn that to, to get ahead, you've got to manipulate and control others. You've got to push yourself forward at the expense of other people. And that nobody in the world of work is there for, to protect your back. That everybody is basically advancing their own self-interest. So they started to in, internalize the ethos of the world of work, which is the ethos of the capitalist marketplace, and then bring that home into personal life. And as people brought that home into personal life, they, it became harder to sustain loving relationships. Um, families were um, being undermined. People were learning to look at other people primarily in terms of, what can you do for me? What's in it for me? How can I get something from you? And they often voted for right-wing candidates because the right-wing candidates were at least talking about a spiritual crisis in the society. They were talking about the breakdown of family. They were talking about um, a sense of meaning to life, and particularly the right-wing churches, whereas the left was talking only about economic entitlements and political rights. Now, we were totally identified and support the left on economic entitlements and political rights, but we started Tikkun to try to explain to the left that they needed to, it needed to also address the spiritual crisis in American society, the hunger that people have for meaning. We, at first we called it a politics of meaning, then now we're calling it a spiritual progressive politics. But that hunger for some framework of meaning and purpose is spread throughout the whole society. Now, not that people don't care about money, of course they do, but a lot of what we learned in our research was that people were fighting for more money as a compensation for a life that they felt was meaningless otherwise. And what they fantasized was, well, at least on my vacations or when I retire, I'll have some money so I can do what I believe in, because right now I'm stuck in a world of work in which I can't really do very much. I, da, 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 da. Filho de sobreviventes do Holocausto, Jay Gabriel chega aos Estados Unidos ainda jovem. Seus pais querem que seja rabino. Ele sonha em ser o Bob Dylan. Nos anos 80, faz o caminho de volta para a tradição. I 
I'd lift you up On loving eagle wings I have brought you back to me You will be my precious one For all the earth is mine You will be a sacred family In touch with the divine Forever, for all time Julie was a lesbian rabbi who was very out, one of the first really out lesbian rabbis, talented woman, brilliant woman, went to Swarthmore, brilliant woman. Anyway, so they invite me over and they say, you know, you don't have to drive so far back, you have to go all the way up three hours, you just came to be with Zalman. We have an extra bedroom here. You should use it. So I, I used the bedroom a couple of times. About the third or fourth time, they said, we have a question for you. Sit down. <laughs> and here's the question. Would you mind giving us some sperm? Julie really wants to have a baby. So I thought about it and I said, okay. And they started laughing because they said, you don't know how many guys we've asked who are willing to make love to anybody but God forbid you really want to get a child out of it. No, please don't touch my sperm. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so I, ca I was the first person who said yes to them. All right. So what happened was I said, you know, there's no, no guarantee this is going to take. And I said, yes, yes, yes. So, you know, I went up to a private room. But the idea was that you would be father. Would, I would not be father. She had a contract and she said, I'm going to pay you for it. I said, you don't have to pay me. No, no, I have to pay you. I want it to be contractual. And the contract says, it's not my child. Rafi Greenberg was born uh, a year later, and then a year and a half later she asked me again. I said, I don't know. Okay. You know, she's a good mother, very talented woman, but she's single. She's raising the children alone. So I said, again, I'm not sure this is going to work. She said, got pregnant immediately again, and uh, nine months later, Zoe Greenberg comes out. Both tremendous children. Smart, friendly, kind because they're raised in a very loving home. Now, Julie comes back to me another time and said, I can't do this. Karmically, <laughs> two for me is a, is a lot, man. I understand you're a great mom, but you got three to deal with already. She says, no, no, I can do it. I said, so what she does, it's very beautiful. She goes to Guatemala and she adopts two children more. And it's almost like a miracle story because what she does is she uses the Mount Dairy community with a lot of renewal rabbis and reconstructionists. She uses that community to uh, you know, create male models for him, to create friends, and people to take some of the responsibility because she can't do it alone, really. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing about it takes a village to, to raise a child was literally true in her case because she's got five kids. She also has, has a synagogue downtown. She was doing weddings. She was one of the first to do gay weddings you know, and be open about it. Não existe a experiência de traição que não venha acompanhada de apego. Quando indivíduos que mantêm relações afetivas fazem movimentos transgressivos movidos pela alma, são imediatamente confrontados com movimentos de apego pelo corpo. O desequilíbrio maior em um casamento surge quando um dos dois dá um passo em frente. Quando um cônjuge esboça transformações em sua pessoa, implicando transformações na relação, o outro muitas vezes cobra justamente os compromissos assumidos, dando um passo para trás. Se numa relação alguém se modifica, o pacto é este. Todos devem se colocar em movimento. A reação de dar um passo para trás, expondo carências, coletando justificativas ou evocando direitos, é um apego, que em si é a maior das traições ao sonho assumido em pacto. Entenda-se por infidelidade tanto o rompimento de compromissos como a manutenção dos mesmos de forma destrutiva. Há traições pela fidelidade muito mais violentas do que as traições pela transgressão. Quantos casamentos são uma traição profunda à promessa de uma vida de mútuo enriquecimento afetivo? Viver esse tipo de casamento após se terem esgotado todas as medidas para curar a relação é uma forma de traição à alma bem mais séria do que um possível adultério representa. Olá.
pós-doutora em filosofia, escritora premiada, Rebecca Goldstein se especializou na trajetória de Baruch Spinoza. Além de obras acadêmicas, ela escreveu livros de ficção onde os personagens enfrentam questões ligadas à fé e à capacidade de compreender os mistérios do mundo físico. Well, I was brought up, you know, very orthodox. I come from a long line of rabbis, um, and uh, my brother is a is a orthodox rabbi. But I, you know, I think that you know, had I been a boy, whatever that means, you know, uh, to, to imagine that, I probably would have gotten caught up in the same kind of intellectual world uh, that my nephews are now involved in, and uh, you know, I would have been a, a very different life for me. But one day I was in school, and it was a class in historia and Jewish history, and the story was told of Baruch, of, of Baruch Spinoza, of this boy in 17th century Amsterdam who grew into, who was brought up in a good Jewish community. And he, um, you know, he, he, he rebelled, he betrayed, he was um, expelled from his own community, and then it fell on greater Christian Europe to condemn him, to excoriate him. He was considered, you know, a, a, he was a, a disgrace, you know, uh -huh. to the Jews of Shanda. Uh -huh. he, uh -huh. he didn't voice any of his doubts and his heresy um, until both of his parents had died because of, and she used the phrase, shalom bayit, peace in the household, not to cause controversy within your family and to be a disgrace to your family. And I remember, because I was already not a believer, completely not a believer, and I remember thinking, I'm going to be just like Spinoza, that this is exactly the right way to do it, to think your thoughts, you know, and try to go with them in your own head but until my parents are gone, I'm not. I'm. I'm going to follow his lead, and I promised myself this, and I kept it. Everybody knew within the house, you know, within my family, I wasn't a believer. And you know, every time my mother would like compliment me, like you know, my family would eat over for Pesach, right? Uh -huh. I mean, they trusted sure. my kosher so much they would eat in my house for that because they took it very seriously. They trusted me. Um, but I remember she walked into a kitchen once my kitchen and I had just, you know, made it all, everything covered the whole deal and I'm a complete atheist at this point, right? And I'm teaching philosophy and I'm just, but my mother said, I'm very proud of you. You know, I don't think there's another kitchen as kosher as yours. And I said, <laughs> for this you're proud of me? You know, it was like, um, and you know, and I'd be very forthright. I'd say, you know, I'm doing it for you and my extended family. I don't believe in it. You know, uh -huh. I didn't want to be a hypocrite, uh -huh. you know, because actions sometimes, you know, usually sure. actions seem to connote belief, and I had none, you know. A partir da epigenética, que reintroduz ideias de Lamarck, fazendo correções na teoria da evolução de Charles Darwin, Eva Jablonka defende que a evolução vai além de uma seleção de variações casuais nos genes. Something that is happening to them from many, many directions. And I think one, one of the interesting things that is happening from the side of science is that uh, we are learning that our uh, dichotomies, the way that we divided the world, and we thought that these divisions were robust and were definite, are not so robust. Everything is much more fuzzy and much more fluid. And all the boundaries between, let's say, genetics and development and evolution are not so rigid. There is not a development and then evolution. And in addition to that, when you're thinking about animals who do not have a symbolic system, but nevertheless have social life and social learning, they also transmit information and create their own tradition, their own non-symbolic cultures, which are also very, very important. And you cannot understand the evolution of uh, the creatures in this world, and of course not of human beings who have also the cultural system, without taking into consideration all these dimensions of heredity. Uh, we all know that when uh, we build, live in a particular environment, and we live a particular, a particular type of life, this has physiological aspects. 
this is internalized, is, is becomes part of our physiology, kind of Lamarckian view. And this was no, 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 no for a very long time. For me, it was very interesting to, to, to see uh, in, in Talmudic tradition, you know, we always keep the, the opinion of the minority, mm -hmm. the, the opinion that was not the, the, the accepted opinion. Because in the future, maybe you can, you can use it back <laughs> and to see Lamarck, which when I studied biology, was the, the guy, you know, the, the, the erratic, but not only the erratic, the guy that had the, the completely wrong idea about what, what it was. Like in the Talmud, but not as a, 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 as a method, mm -hmm. you always have people who think outside the box, always, because this is human nature. I, I go back to the, the, the three tribes that you didn't explain. Uh, what, what are the three tribes? So one is the tribe that, of the conservatives. They're just doing always the same thing, even when there is a new challenge. So they go extinct. And then you have the explorers. They explore like crazy, but they shoot completely in the dark. They try everything. And they usually miss. Maybe sometimes they don't miss, but usually they will miss. And in the middle, you have the interpreters. That are doing, that are making the educated guesses, that are saying, well, this is new, but it is a little bit similar to this. So let's make an interpretation, a new interpretation, and try exploring in this in this direction rather than in all directions. So these are the interpreters, and and what we're saying is that this kind of strategies you you can you you have them all over, everywhere. The, you mean, you mean the, the, the species that we have that survived are, are the interpreters. I think so. I think that this is not just, you know, for a very long time we thought that the process of, a, of variation, of generation of variation was completely random. It was like shooting in the dark, completely. And one of the things that we are learning is that the process of, our, of genera generating variation itself, the process of exploration, is not completely blind. It always has a stochastic element to it, but it's not completely blind. There is always, there are many, many mechanisms that allow you to have educated guesses. And yes, I think that the species that we have in our world are those that have mechanisms that allow them to make intelligent guesses, uh, educated guesses. Oh. And I thought she, she calls you Abba. She calls you both Abba. I'm Abba, he's Daddy. Daddy, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> and she, and she, uh, she, she goes back and forth, which of the men in her life are her favorites? It's, okay. Today it's daddy. I think this week daddy. Hey, there was a gay Orthodox couple on the Upper West Side of New York that we get together once a month for Shabbat for dinner and davening. And I think you maybe were there just a couple of times, but kind of we, we you were still closeted, so he was very you know it was very low key. Um, yeah, I yeah, we've never met. Never Sandy brought him over to the house, and uh, and he volunteered to fix my table. He said, "Your table is a little shaky." Called me. I fix tables. I thought, Ooh, "Who wants to fix my table?" <laughs> okay. Not, come on. <laughs> what's, what's first intention or second intention? <laughs> exactly. My first intention was to help him out with his table. His second intention, I have no idea. What <laughs> I have dreamt many times of standing in front of a large audience. We're just standing in front of some personage that's known, and suddenly I discover I'm naked. I dreamt, I dreamed that, a dream that could haunt anyone who feels vulnerable to public scrutiny. Someone in the garden told me I was naked. A snake, it appears, has convinced me that I am hiding from God, from judging eyes. I have for many years sewn myself fig leaves, makeshift and almost incriminating. So I am caught trying to decide whether I ought to play along with the story to be grateful for the divine caring of the fig leaf, for the kotonot or the, the, uh, the scraps of, of, of animal skins that God provides the human to cover up their shame, or whether I have to expose the lie, refuse the clothes, and shout out that covering shame with either fig leaves or animal skins does not work. It does not end the shame. Thanks to the Midrash, I have a third option. The clothing God provides, according to the Midrash, was not made of animal skins, with an ayin, but with light, with an aleph. Such clothing points to a place beyond the brazen shamelessness one on one hand and closeted submission on the other. I will try to sleep now and imagine myself dressed in light, clear and undaunted, shameless and true, 
with an answer to the question prepared. Where are you? Right here. A proposta da imutabilidade é mais do que indecorosa. Ela violenta o indivíduo. Ela propõe que continuemos a fazer o que já foi feito no passado. Transgredir é um processo. E o momento em que nos voltamos para outra direção marca um novo segmento de nossas histórias individuais e coletivas. O verdadeiro grande crime do ser humano é que ele pode dar uma simples volta a qualquer momento, mas não o faz. Duas coisas ficam comprometidas pela ausência de transgressão. A qualidade de vida e a possibilidade de continuidade. I introduced my family overseas. I say that I come from a typically abnormal Israeli family because there are no normal Israeli family. We're all crazy. And so my parents were both Holocaust survivors with my mother being orphaned. You know, she, uh, she was in the Warsaw Ghetto in the beginning of the war and escaped it. And my father had survived the war by hiding for 600 days in a hole in the ground that was not uh, wide enough for him to lie or deep, deep enough for him to stand. And uh, they came to Israel, they had a family. I have two siblings, the eldest, my brother, had started the legalized marijuana movement, uh, and he's a very, very strong and extreme left-wing anti-Zionist, uh, who's really, uh, who, who demonstrated for many times, you know, in, in Palestine, arrested, got beaten, you know. Uh, and about eight years ago, he decided to leave Israel with his wife. They moved to Thailand where he still conducts all his social initiatives uh, from a tree house with high-speed internet. So he's my old, old, he's the eldest, and my sister, uh, she became Hasidic. She lives in Jerusalem in Mea Shearim. Before that, she lived in a settlement in Emmanuel, and she has 12 children and 12 grandchildren. And I'm a writer. So many people say to me, how come, like, what did your parents teach each kid something different, they say to the big brother, smoke pot, and to the sister, pray to God. And, and I said, no, but they gave us the same legacy. And the idea was that both my parents being children of war, they always wanted us to transcend our material existence. They always wanted us, all their life they had to fight, to find shelter, to find food, and they wanted more for us. And when I asked my father, father, what, what do you want me to be when I grow up? And he said, well, you know what, if 30 years from now, you will be a very rich doctor, and you have a beautiful wife and a beautiful house, and that's it, I would be very disappointed. He couldn't explain to me positively what he wanted, but he could say negatively, I don't want you to be rich, mm -hmm. I don't want you to be comfortable, I want you to do the things that I couldn't do. And it felt very much for me that me and, and my, my siblings, we, our, our parents took us all the way to this wall. And they say, we want you to get to the other side of the world. We don't know what there is there, but we can help you. Step on our back and jump. Mm -hmm. Nascido em uma família judaica, foi reconhecido como reencarnação de um mestre budista tibetano. A família resiste em aceitar que se torne monge. Michel fez a transição para se tornar Lama Michel Rinpoche. Quando, na verdade, eu escolhi de ir para a Índia, de me tornar um monge, seguir esse caminho, né? Foi uma coisa que, para mim, sempre fez sentido. E a única resposta que eu encontrei na época foi, tudo isso vai me servir para muito bem. E a universidade, me formar, se tudo der certo, conseguir um trabalho que eu goste e ganhe bem. 
E eu comecei a olhar a minha volta e eu via muita gente que dinheiro não faltava, tinha uma ótima educação, tudo, mas é que estavam muito felizes, de verdade. Né? E aquele encontro foi importante porque eu senti com você, ao mesmo tempo, uma sintonia. Né? Eu senti, ah, muito bem, ele me entende. Eu me senti que compreendido. Isso, diante dos olhos da minha avó, foi importante para ela também, acredito, naquele momento. No budismo, a gente tem vários tipos de votos. Porque a proibição, de uma certa forma, ela se encontra quando alguém te diz você não pode fazer algo. né? E são três níveis. São que são chamados os votos da liberação pessoal, que é pratimoksha, que são os votos monásticos, que são muito práticos, são todas as coisas externas. né? E uh, uma grande parte desses votos vem da época de Buda, na comunidade monástica, na qual acontecia uma coisa, sei lá, o monge não pode fazer xixi em pé. Por quê? Porque naquela época não tinha banheiro. Aí aconteceu de um monge lá fazer xixi em pé. Alguém vê, criticar, olha os monges como são mal educados, não sei o quê. Então, o monge tem que fazer xixi agachado. Vira uma regra. Hoje em dia, a regra não vale mais. Está no banheiro fechado, tem quem diz, não, a regra, a regra tem que seguir. Você pode estar no banheiro fechado, tem que fazer xixi sentado. E tem outros que dizem, não, a regra, no momento no qual a razão dela deixa de existir, a regra cai. Está lembrando aqui uma história, uma história racídica que tem de um... Um mestre racídico que proíbe o filho de ler um livro, que era um livro que tinha sido censurado pela, uhum. pela tradição. E aí tem um incêndio na, na biblioteca e esse manuscrito é queimado junto com outros livros. E ele fica desesperado, porque ele, ele mesmo não tinha lido esse livro. E ele corre para o filho e diz, você leu? Você leu? E ele diz, pai, como é que eu vou ler se você me disse que era proibido? Criado dentro da tradição judaica e conhecedor dos ritos do seu povo, o professor Noam Chomsky exerce o um papel acidamente crítico das religiões e de políticas do Estado de Israel. As a child, I thought I'm going to be more religious than my father, but then I observed my grandfather, who was ultra orthodox, and I remember one son, uh, one of the holidays. Passover, I guess. We were visiting them, and I noticed that he was smoking. And I asked my father how he can smoke, because the sure. Talmudic principle says uh, no, no difference between Shabbat and a holiday, except with regard to eating. So my father said, well, he's decided that smoking is eating. So I realized that the Jewish religion, I suppose every religion, is based on the assumption that God is an imbecile. <laughs> uh, we can fool him, you know. Uh, and in fact, if you look through the history of religion, I think that's true. Uh, Pascal has a wonderful essay in uh, Provincial Letters called, uh, I think it's called The Utility of Interpretations. It's by the Jesuits and how they are able to interpret the Gospels so that it means the opposite of what it says. So if the Gospels say you should give alms to the poor, There's an interpretation which says it means you keep it for yourself, you know, and uh, so on. And the idea is God won't understand because he's not very bright. And if religion is based on the assumption that God is so stupid he can't understand that we're cheating him, what's the point of being religious? Para o texto bíblico, a linhagem feminina é que tem o protagonismo na traição. De um lado, temos o episódio das duas filhas de Lote, que escapam com o pai da hecatombe de Sodoma e Gomorra e pensam que não há mais sobreviventes. Para salvar a semente da espécie, embebedam Lote para engravidar dele. Cada filha gera uma criança. Uma delas recebe o nome de Moab, filho de meu pai. Gerações mais tarde, Ruth, uma moabita, Será o elo entre esta transgressão e um dos lados da descendência do rei Davi, de onde se originará o Messias, segundo a tradição. Do outro lado desta descendência está Tamar, viúva de um dos filhos de Judá, 
Ela reivindica um herdeiro para dar continuidade à semente. De acordo com a tradição, poderia engravidar de um dos três cunhados, mas não consegue. Anos depois, disfarçada de prostituta, engravida do sogro. Desta relação, gerações adiante, aparecerá Boaz, que juntamente com Ruth, formarão a linhagem do rei Davi. Mesmo na história de Ruth e Boaz, há descumprimento da lei. O resgate da viuvez de Ruth, bem mais jovem que Boaz, não acontece por quem teria tradicionalmente esta responsabilidade. É Boaz, bem mais velho, que o faz sinalizando aspectos incestuosos nesta solução. As filhas de Lot, Tamar e Ruth, são responsáveis pela gestação deste filho messiânico, nascido não das convenções e da lei, mas de sua transgressão. Ex-presidente da Universidade de Al-Quds e ex-representante da Autoridade Palestina em Jerusalém, o professor Sari Nusseib exerce um papel moderador. Por tradição, sua família guarda as chaves que abrem as portas da área das mesquitas em Jerusalém. Eu tenho uma relação muito difícil com Jerusalém. É como uma relação de amor e amor. Uma relação de amor e amor. Uh, I don't know exactly how to describe it. On the one hand, I feel that uh, as I grew up, I, I uh, looked upon myself first as a Jerusalemite, uh, you know, rather than being a Jordanian or Palestinian or uh, Muslim, you know, a Jerusalemite, and that the city was something that was somehow idyllic for me and so on. But um, at one stage, I started rebelling against this because I felt I was being a captive. Uh, to something unreal. Uh -huh. And then the kind of Jerusalem that I saw evolving around me and building up over the last 20, 30 years, you know, in our case, you know, looking at settlements, looking at the transformations and so on, has made me less and less, uh, uh, less and less uh, in love with the city. And, and uh, I, I somehow, I think, you know, the, 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 the process I went through which is to liberate myself from the love of the city, is one that I think is necessary for everyone who is in love with the city. I think they need to liberate themselves uh, from the love of that city. And in particular, from the love, again, I'm sorry to say this, but uh, as a rabbi, uh, but you know, the, the holiness with which we, which we ascribe to rock and to stone, which seems to me to be, uh, and this goes back to what I was saying about human values, which seems at one point to lead to bloodshed, uh, to me is, 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 a, is a contradiction. You know, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't hold up. The story of, of Abraham and, and, and the sacrifice. What concerns me is the fact that, well, two matters, but the one matter that is relevant to what I'm saying is, The fact that at the end of the day, God, God told him, don't do it. Change his mind. Change his mind. You can do something else. He just wanted to test him. But no, you don't kill your son. It is his son. And, you know, whatever it, whatever it was, God told him no. So not over a rock. Don't shed blood on this rock, the blood of your son on this rock on, on my behalf. And you, you need to sort of get this message. And you need, therefore, to liberate yourself from the love of the rock. In 2006, a group of ex-soldiers, Israelis and Palestinians, raise their arms and fund the movement Combatentes pela Paz to break the cycle of violence, uniting the forces of the two sides of the conflict. You know, it's very difficult to be a Palestinian, sometimes. It's very strange and difficult to grow up under a strange occupation. 
that you don't understand their language, you don't understand why they came to occupy you or to control you as kids. So because we think that we have no other choice, we have no safe place for ourselves, we became victims of the occupation. It means we became a fighters when we were 16 years old with two grenades and Kalashnikov. Uh, my group used the two grenades against the Israeli patrols. And of course, in that time, no one killed, no one injured, because we don't know how to use it in a professional way. At the age of 17, we have been arrested. And the first one got 21 years in jail, uh, 19, 15, 14. And I get seven years. Now it's not anymore a game. You are a fighter, you are a hero, you are a warrior, you are in jail now and you have a long seven years, so you need to understand who is your enemy. First of all, I grew up in a family. The story that I always tell you, in the peace, is in my father's father, who was a prisoner from Europe, before the war. He was the only one of his family who was born from Europe. He came to Palestine, to Palestine, to Israel. ואחרי המלחמה, ב-45, הסתבר לו שלא נשאר אף אחד מהמשפחה שלו. אז אני גדלתי עם זה בילדות שלי, שהציונות זה לא איזה קונספט, זה לא קולוניאליזם, זה לא גזענות, אלא הציונות זה פשוט מה שהציל את סבא שלי. וגדלתי בכלל בלי השאלה אם זה נכון או לא נכון, אלא זה פשוט... מה, שגד... מה שלומדים פה במערכת החינוך זה שציונות שווה הצלת חיים של העם היהודי. Um, והיה לי ברור מגיל מאוד צעיר שאני רוצה לשרת בצבא, שאני רוצה להיות קרבי, ואכן um, התגייסתי לצבא, נהייתי חייל קרבי, נהייתי קצין. אינג'ל, אני רואה שמובי על ההולוקוסט. ולבחירי, ההולוקוסט, מישהו נקרא היטלר, נקרא 6 מיליון יהודים, ואתה לא חושב על זה. זה פשוט כמו מספר. ובגלל שזה לא נקרא לי, לפלסטינים, 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 לפלסטינים. Uh, so I understand this movie is about Hitler and the Jewish. I want to enjoy seeing this movie as kind of revenge. At least because I'm in their jail, they torture me, they occupied me. So at least to see a movie, to see someone torture them, win over them. And in a few minutes, I found myself crying. I get sympathy with those innocent people. I forget that they are Jewish. I, I get very angry because I didn't see those people fighting back. סיימתי את השירות הצבאי שלי כסגן, ואז התחלתי לעשות מילואים. לאורך הקריירה האומנותית שלי התחלתי ללמוד משחק, נהייתי שחקן מקצועי בתיאטרון רפרטוארי בישראל, והייתי אומן מאוד מחויב לאומנות, ומאוד אהבתי את מה שאני עושה. אבל חודש בשנה הייתי יוצא מהחיים שלי. <coughs> ומשרת את הכיבוש. וחודש בשנה הייתי מתנתק מזה, והולך ועומד במחסומים, ומונע מנשים בהיריון ללכת לבית חולים, ועושה חיפושים בבתים ומעצרים. מפר זכויות אדם ברמות מסיביות. My jailer, he was very extremist, because in general they are not allowed to talk to us and to understand our stories. They need to treat us as killers, terrorists, bloody people, dangerous people, and that's it. And for us, they are our jailers. Nothing worse than that. And once he want one jailer, he want to talk to me, and he say, it's not good for you to be a terrorist or a killer. Why you are here? So in that time, I answer him that you are the killer, you are the terrorist, I'm a freedom fighter. And which is something very important when you are fighting. We use the word arm struggle, which is something moral. It's not terrorist, terrorism, it's not violence. Uh, so he wants to understand why I am a, a terrorist. Uh, because he thinks that we are settlers, we are occupiers. My story, my narrative, we are not occupiers. We are under the occupation. But I understand that he believed that we are occupiers. So in some place, I want to explain to him that we are not occupiers. So I said to him, you know, maybe we are settlers, I don't know. Let us talk. I have a long seven years, if you can convince me. And this is how we start to talk. So each time he come to his job as a jailer, we start to talk. In a few months, we became a very close friends. He understand that we are not 
occupiers, we are not settlers, we are not killers. The occupation creates from us fighters. In the same time, later on, I understand that I already changed my way, my mind, because I want to accept him too, to see him as a human being. ורק אז התחלתי לראות פתאום, עד גיל 29, שנהייתי אבא לילדה קטנה, לתינוקת, כשהייתי עושה סיורים בתוך מחנות פליטים, בתוך ערים, הייתי רואה ילדים וילדות פלסטינים. אבל הם, הם לא נראו לי הם, תינוקות, חמודים, חמודות, כמו, כמו שפתאום קרה לי כשהייתה לי כבר ילדה. Uh... Maybe after around less than one year, in the 1st of October 1987, before, like two months before the first intifada, uh, we are in one section, 120 prisoners from the age of 12 to 19 years old, only 12 years old. And for the occupation, they are terrorists, they are killers. In that day, we are hearing an uh, alarm, enter to our section more than 100 Uh, soldiers, they stand in two lines in our corridor. So I start to shout in Arabic, in Hebrew, in English. They continue beating me, but in the end of the corridor, six soldiers take me aside and they start to repeat me again. And in the middle of that, someone came and lay on me with his body to protect me. And this was my jailer because he come to his job. So he's seeing them beating me directly he come to פרוטקט מי, which was very dangerous for him, for his job. היום אני עובד באוניברסיטה בתל אביב, אני עושה פרויקטים עם ישראלים ופלסטינים, אני עובד הרבה בבתי כלא, עם אסירים, עם מכורים, עם פגועי נפש, עם פליטים מאפריקה, ואני משתמש בתיאטרון כדי לשחרר את עצמי ולשחרר אנשים אחרים. ומצאתי את עצמי, אמנם מתאמן על טנקים במשך השירות הצבאי שלי, אבל רוב הזמן הייתי עסוק בלדכא אוכלוסייה פלסטינית באינתיפאדה. והקלאש וה... הזה בין הדימוי שהיה לי איך אני מגן על מדינת ישראל לבין המכות שאני דופק לילדים פלסטינים שזורקים אבנים או פליש, פולש לבתים כל לילה והופך אה, אה, בתי מגורים של אנשים חפים מפשע, פתאום, אתה יודע, כשהייתה לי ילדה בת שנתיים והייתי רואה ילדה פלסטינית, תינוקת בת שנתיים או שלוש, אז היה מייצר אצלי את הקשר לילדה שלי הפרטית. לפני זה ראיתי טרוריסטים קטנים. פתאום אתה, משהו, משהו מתחבר, ואתה אומר, הילדה הזאת, יש לה אבא כמוני, שאוהב אותה כמוני, והיא מתוקה, והיא לא טרוריסטית, והיא לא ירתה עליי, והיא לא... היא כמו הילדה שלי בדיוק. והגיע רגע שלא יכולתי יותר לספר לעצמי את הסיפור הזה שאפשר גם וגם. ואז סירבתי לשרת בשטחים, והתארגנו קבוצה של קצינים וחיילים, וכתבנו וכתב, עצומה שאנחנו מסרבים, והיה סקנדל גדול ב-2002, ינואר, קראו לנו בוגדים, ואמרו שזה קופ דה תא, ושמו אותי בכלא לחודש. אבל ידענו שאנחנו עושים את הדבר הנכון. ובמהלך התקופה הזאת מישהו סיפר לנו שיש קבוצה כזאת בפלסטין של לוחמים לשעבר, שישבו הרבה שנים בבתי הכלא הישראלים, והם מתנגדים למאבק הפלסטיני האלים לשחרור. הם חושבים שהפלסטינים צריכים להיות מחויבים למאבק בלתי אלים, והתחלנו להיפגש איתם. which is unbelievable for me to see Israeli soldiers and officers, pilots from elite units who refuse to take part of the occupation. So I wish to meet those people. Three years later, here in Beit Lahem in Everest, it was the first meeting between four Palestinians, ex-prisoners, I was one of them, and seven ex-Israeli officers. And you can imagine the first meeting. I wish that I can escape. I don't, which year was that? In 2005. I don't want to check their hands. They are criminals for me. They are killers. They are my jailers, my killers, who torture me in the checkpoints every day. So it means two people like Bassam and Kamoni, who physically, concretely, for 20 years, for 25 years, we were killed one another. 
ירינו אחד על השני. יש אנשים בלוחמים לשלום שהם הם, פיזית, קונקרטית, היו באותן זירות, ירו אחד על השני. This is what I told them when we decide to create combatants for peace. You need to, uh, to remember, we are not friends, we are not brothers, we are real enemies. But we want to create a partnership, we are partners. If we became friends or brothers in the way when we work together, it's not bad. But this is, remember, this is not our goal at all. So we don't need to love each other. We need to have, to be partners. Today we are sitting ועובדים ביחד ונאבקים ביחד בכיבוש ואני מכיר את הילדים של בסם והוא מכיר את הילדים שלי ואנחנו מבלים ביחד ו... <coughs> ובאמת רואים אחד את השני ואפילו אוהבים אחד את השני. And the first year we became 300 members. It take a lot time to agree on the name Combatants for Peace. Combatants, it's a combat soldiers. But then we discover that we start to be a real combatant soldiers when we have the courage to talk. Two years later, on the 16th of January 2007, uh, an Israeli border police, who was a teenager, shot and killed my 10 years old daughter, Abir. She was my third child in front of her school, 9.15 in the morning, from a distance of 15 to 20 meters, in her head, from the back, in a normal day. She was with her sister and two other girls. She fell down, and two days later, she passed away in Hadassah Hospital. For that, when I met the killer, which I call him the victim, in the Israeli court after three years, and I know in his background, it's not a crime to kill a Palestinian. It's not a crime at all. So I told him, I need you to know that you are not a warrior. You are not a hero. You didn't kill the enemy or the terrorist. You just killed ten years innocent girl. When my child was born, I was born in a hospital, a long time after I was already in the war for peace. And there was a lot of blood in the blood, meningitis. And in the middle of the night, you know, it was a big deal here, and it was a big deal, and I and my wife were in hysteria. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, you see the child apathy, it's a pain of love. כאילו, תחושה שאפשר לאבד את הילד. ונכנסנו לאוטו, נסענו לבית חולים, ויש כזה שומר בבית חולים. Mm-hmm. והיא כזה מחזיקה את הילד בידיים, ואני אומר לו, תפתח את השער. והוא כזה אומר, לאן? ואני אומר לו, תינוק, תפתח את השער. והוא פותח את השער, ואני נוסע, והמחשבה הראשונה שיש לי, זה כל האנשים שבאו עם תינוק למחסום, ואני אמרתי להם, אתה לא עובר. One Israeli soldier shot and killed my daughter, but more than 100 ex-Israeli soldiers and officers come to build her garden, in her school, in her memory. And this is how to use your pain to build more bridge, even with your enemy. And this is uh, because the pain is ongoing pain forever. You need how to deal with it, how to uh, direct it. Of course, two days later, directly, I joined the Peral Circle Families Forum together with 620 Israeli-Palestinian families who tried to spread a very simple message. We need to exist. We must exist, both sides, on this land, as one state, two states, five states. Otherwise, we will share it as two big graves to our kids and ourselves. Cada vez que fazemos o esperado, reforçamos um padrão humano automático de torpor. Existe em nós uma tendência de querer agradar a nós, aos outros e a moral de nossa cultura. Com isso, vamos gradativamente nos perdendo de nós mesmos. E o despertar é a capacidade de perceber situações horríveis em nossas vidas, tanto no plano particular como no social e cultural. Desse horror surge uma nova forma de ser. Uma nova forma de família, uma nova forma de propriedade e uma nova forma de tradição. Aquele que não faz uso de todo o potencial de sua vida, de alguma maneira diminui o potencial de todos os demais. Não, 
Nascido na Bielorrússia, foi morar em Israel nos anos 90. O coreógrafo estuda a forma com que as questões políticas e sociais afetam o corpo físico. My first encounter with the archive material was through the social media. It was through a, a clip where a small child who is a bit drunk during a Purim celebration kind of violently banging on the, on the, on the door of a Palestinian house. I was quite overwhelmed uh, by this scene and I was questioning what engages such a small child into such a violent, expressive physicality. Whereas before I was also working together with the um, Palestinian collaborators living in, inside Israel in my productions, in Archive it's, it's the first time that I direct my gaze towards what is happening in the occupied territories, addressing questions that r related to the resonance of the occupation on our bodies. And what I see is troubling, especially in this location where the border is really being negotiated. The, the body is claiming its territory. Especially archive, especially this work, which uses um, materials of B'Tselem, which is a human rights organization working to expose human rights abuses towards Palestinians. Of course, this co uh, cooperation of me with this organization is criticized by people who do not want this information to be exposed. The idea is that I'm engaging the audience into a different kind of watching. Because we are all uh, practicing watching in our daily life. And we, a lot, we're watching a lot of violence also. Uh, usually much worse violence that I'm showing in, in the work. But I think that through this proposition, the idea is that can we generate a different kind of spectatorship? Todos nós é, construímos é, na nossa identidade, na nossa formação, um território. Todos nós somos um pouco fundamentalistas. E é um território que não é autêntico, é um território que representa um lugar estreito, um lugar onde a gente se sente protegido. E é, né, é nesse momento que vai se construindo, vai se sedimentando um território que para todos nós é o território da nossa identidade. E em dado momento ele vai se transformar num lugar pequeno. A vida vai convidar a fazer esse movimento para fora desse território. A saída desse território é sempre percebida como imoral. Nascido Jeffrey, nos anos 90, Iska Smith enfrenta os preconceitos e faz a transição de gênero, rompendo com a tradição para preservar sua autenticidade. Resgata sua identidade e, com o tempo, reconstrói sua relação com a tradição. If we were born perfect, we wouldn't need to be here. Some of us, it's more external, some it's more internal, some it's more challenging, some it's more, it's more subtle. But none of us come into the world without something. We're all a work in progress. From early on, as far back as I can remember, perhaps at five years old, I felt something was really wrong with inside of me. Now, this is not 2015. This is like in the mid-50s, 1950s. I really believed two things. I believed that I'm a girl, and I don't know how this could be because my body looked like a boy and everyone kept saying I'm a boy. So how could it be that, including my mother and father, my own parents, be lying to me, yet I knew that I'm really a girl? I really built up a whole life. I mean, I had um, put into the world, helped put into the world six children. In 1991, it all fell apart actually during the Gulf War crisis. And my family I had to, got divorced. That's when I first became aware. It wasn't until 1992, I was back in the States maybe a couple of months, and I read this article about someone who transitioned. Uh, at that point, I was 41. This person was in her 50s. And I said, oh my gosh, there's a way out of this prison. 
I could really bring my body and soul together. They don't have to be in conflict. When I began my transition, it came from within me. It wasn't put on me. It's a piece of God that's called my soul that I found and discovered and felt within me. And it isn't written. Where is it written that I'm supposed to lead a life of truth as a lie? Nowhere. Ba'af makom. Ba'af makom. It's never written that in order to live an honest life, I have to lie. I mean, that's a paradox. That's an oxymoron. We all need every human being, Jew, non-Jew, LGBT, non-LGBT, older, younger, black, white, everything in between, Israeli, non-Israeli, every human being is born into not only a world where he or she needs to undergo some type of I'm a work in progress, but that I'm a work in progress individually is part of a global redemption. And the redemption, I'm not talking about necessarily the redemption that the prophets are speaking about. It's really a redemption from everything that's holding me back from doing that is a state of enslavement. And moving from enslavement, moving from avdut to chirut, to really be free to who I was designed to be in order to go about the tikkun, that's what I would like to share with people. So it's not about you understanding my gender transition. It's really about me as a teacher, as a spiritual mentor, as a fellow human being, as a fellow Jew, as a fellow woman, as a fellow Israeli, as a fellow whatever you want to fill in the blank with, understanding, well, let's explore together what's holding both of us back. And maybe we can inspire each other. Maybe we can share. I don't have all the answers. You surely don't have all the answers. No one does. So let's dialogue. And let's leave the gender part, the gender transition, let's leave that on a shelf, you know, put it gently on a shelf. We'll get back to it at a later date. What's much more important is that we connect. So this was not easy, of course, for my mom and dad to process. But when my mom saw me for the first time after the complete transition, after the surgery, so we, we were both a little bit nervous, and we hugged, and we started to cry a little. And then she looked at me, and she said, you have nothing to explain. As hard as this is for me, you have nothing to explain. I see something in your eyes I have never seen before. I see peace. And from when you were a little child, I knew something was not right, just in your eyes. I didn't know what it was. And there I am saying, oh gosh, mom, thank you. And then she looks at me. She said, okay, you know, I don't like your outfit. Let's go shopping. (laughs) (laughs) Great. É mais conveniente apresentar Satã apenas como resultado do risco e da transformação do que também como pesadelo da acomodação. Satã é a dificuldade que temos de distinguir a luz da escuridão. Muitas vezes a luz não está nem naquilo que promove a preservação, nem no que promove a transformação. Por interesses naturais, a cultura e a moral, no entanto, Nossa sociedade resolveu transformar Satã num espantalho que realmente nos afasta da mudança. É por medo dele que se obteve um instrumento a mais para manter as pessoas ocupadas em seus próprios padrões, sem se permitir ousar e descobrir novas possibilidades da própria vida. Sua linguagem e sua imagem passaram a servir como porta-vozes da imutabilidade, da tradição, da família, e da propriedade. Sua fala eloquente e repleta de exemplos da vida e da realidade são poderosamente paralisadoras. A cantora Mira Awad transgride ao se identificar como palestina e israelense sabotando a ordem estabelecida. Recebe críticas e tem fãs dos dois lados do conflito. 
أنا يوسف يا أبي إخوتي لا يحبونني لا يريدونني بينهم يا أبي يا أبي I grew up in, uh, in Ramli village, which, which is in a Palestinian village in the north of Israel. My father is Palestinian from the same village, and my mother is Bulgarian. Um, they met when my father studied medicine in Bulgaria, so I grew up um, in a Palestinian village, but in a mixed family. And I left when I was 18, and I uh, registered into the university in Haifa. Haifa is a mixed town, both Hebrew and uh, both Jewish and uh, Arab. And I guess only when I was in the university that I actually had to define myself uh, identity-wise. Because when you're, in a, when, when you're growing up in a Palestinian village, you don't wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I'm Palestinian. You're just what you are. And everybody around you is quite the same. So you don't really have to, have to deal, deal with it so much. But when, when I got to the university, I suddenly uh, felt that I would be Arab around. And suddenly my identity, in a way, hit me in the face. If I want to explain how I see the world, I, have, I get a lot of criticism for this, what we're talking about, forgetting my roots, getting away from my origins, you know, uh, even ab abandoning the Palestinian case or the Palestinian heritage. And the way I look at it, I, did, I haven't abandoned my roots. On the contrary, the way I see it, the huma humanity, the human race is like a tree, okay? And I, you're a man of God. You're a man who believes in God. I don't. Mm -hmm. So excuse me for my metaphors that don't come from Adam and Eve. And now there's a big, big tr tree of this human race with all these branches. They're wonderful, all of them, but they're all these little branches and sections and sectors. And what we're doing right now is each one is trying to water only their own branch. You cannot water a tree from its branches. It will die. And this is what humanity is doing right now. If we're talking about Palestinians and, and, and Israelis, they're doing the same. Each one wants to take care of their own. But the way I see it, you cannot take, of, take care of anybody if you don't water the roots, the stem of, of the tree. You know, we're gonna all die if we don't care for each other. Em teu ventre conceberás e darás à luz um filho, e poliás o nome de Jesus. Este será grande e será chamado Filho do Altíssimo. E disse Maria ao anjo, Como se fará isto, visto que não conheço homem algum? E respondendo, o anjo disse-lhe, Descerá sobre ti o Espírito Santo, e a virtude do Altíssimo te cobrirá com a sua sombra. Por isso também o santo que de ti há de nascer será chamado Filho de Deus. O Jesus histórico, ainda em sua condição judaica, antecedendo ao cristianismo, aparece como ligado a uma rede trançada por gerações na gestação de um ser humano maior. Não seria o filho de pedigree castiço, mas o ser humano mutante e ilícito. Nele se depositavam as esperanças da salvação da espécie. Essa inversão de preterir o puro sangue pelo bastardo revela o valor atribuído à alma imoral e sua capacidade evolutiva. A mudança da patrilinearidade, receber a identidade do pai, para a matrilinearidade, receber a identidade da mãe, que acontece na tradição judaica, no período em que Jesus nasce, 
evidencia a necessidade de adaptação. Com a invasão romana e a incapacidade de determinar paternidade, a mudança para matrilinearidade assegurava continuidade. Simbolicamente, o pai transgressor ou o pai ausente fora substituído pelo pai absoluto. Dava-se prosseguimento à trajetória de rompimento estabelecida por Eva. Maria não era a versão pura e resgatada de Eva, mas a mãe legítima dessa espécie que caminhava sempre com aposta maior na mutação do que na preservação. Somos filhos da mutação e seremos salvos pela mutação. No dia da festa, costumava-se soltar um preso qualquer que o povo pedisse. E havia um chamado Barrabás, que preso com outros amotinadores, tinha cometido uma morte. E a multidão, dando gritos, começou a pedir que fizesse como sempre lhes tinha feito. E Pilatos lhes respondeu, dizendo, Quereis que vos solte o rei dos judeus? Mas os principais dos sacerdotes incitaram a multidão para que fosse solto antes Barrabás. Pilatos, respondendo, lhes disse, Que quereis, pois, que se faça daquele a quem chamais rei dos judeus? E eles tornaram a clamar, Crucifica-o! A voz do povo é a escolha da espécie diante de suas inquietudes de sobrevivência. É um julgamento não apenas entre o certo e o errado, mas entre o certo e o errado e o errado certo. De um lado, Barrabás, que em aramaico significa literalmente o filho do pai. E do outro, o filho sem pai, ou melhor, o filho do pai, com P maiúsculo. E com o passar do tempo, a igreja tornou Jesus o símbolo maior da tradição. Abraçou uma moral que policiava condutas, que não poderia ser minimamente desviante. that there isn't a single point of view of reality that you are anchored to, that reality is constantly dynamic. You can see it from this point of view, you can see it from that point of view. And that's very important. Once we saw Earth from outer space, it became very clear to me that every religion is a, uh, an organ, a vital organ of the planet. And so therefore, It's not to say the triumphalist notion that we used to have, Messiah will come and all the going will be wrong, or Jesus will come a second time, say Jews were wrong, all along. but that we all are like a vital organ. Each time as, it, as, as reality continues, there is always a shift involved in that. And new things that could not be accommodated under the old system get accommodated under a new system. Quantas pessoas poderíamos ter tirado para dançar na vida e não fizemos por ofertar sacrifícios ao nada? Sacrifício ao Deus da timidez, ao Deus da vergonha, ao Deus do medo de ser rechaçado e assim por diante? Quantas vezes deveríamos ter dito não em vez de nos desgastarmos para dissimular virtudes que são oferendas idólatras, oferendas ao Deus expectativa, ao Deus cobrança, ao Deus culpa e assim por diante? No dia em que o ser humano enfrentar seu conflito interno, quando vir que sua integridade psíquica está ameaçada por duas vontades primordiais, então o mar se abrirá. Quando atravessar o mar cantando, movido por sua catarse, se verá em meio a outro jardim. Ali tudo será proibido e pronto para ser transgredido. Em paz com sua alma, o ser humano vagará por entre as opções de desobediência. Uma árvore, no entanto, permanecerá permitida. Será a árvore da lembrança de um período em que o correto cumpria a função de velar o medo e a culpa. De mãos dadas com o Criador, o animal imoral terá reencontrado a paz de sua nudez. Despido e ciente desta condição, o homem terá encontrado a tão esperada 
imortalidade da alma.